Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks Saturday, June 9th, 2018. This is episode 1495. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by 23andMe. Now through Father's Day, get 30% off every 23andMe DNA kit. Go to 23andMe.com slash twit today. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy, and it's uh, time to talk tech. Computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We've got your smartphones. We've got your smart watches. we got your digital doodads and gizwiz, gizmagician stuff. All the stuff that's <laughs> changing the world of ours as we speak. If you want to talk about it, if you've got a question, you want some help, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or uh, Canada, outside that area. Oh, you could still call. You just have to uh, use Skype or something like that. 8888-ASK-LEO. The website is techguylabs.com, techguylabs.com, and uh, you'll find everything there that we talk about on the show. All the show notes, all the links, your chance to uh, comment, uh, and it's free and it's open and it's available right now. At TechGuyLabs.com. I was just looking at this box I got in the mail. I got three of them today. It's a um, indoor, uh, I guess, security camera, sort of. Yeah, I guess. I haven't. I'm not. I haven't even opened it yet, so I'm not going to review it. But I thought it was interesting. It's a. It's a what they call a. PTZ, Pan Tilt Zoom Camera. That means you can control it remotely and get it to point at what you wish. It'll go, uh, it'll go uh, 110 degrees a second, <laughs> which means it's pretty fast. Uh, and it, it will record internally, uh, which is kind of cool. And uh, uh, 360 degree horizontal range, 93 degree vertical range. You can have it uh, pan automatically, it can what they call patrol, which means it pans around looking. And then it, it does, it's not always on. It only records when there's motion. All of this is pretty stock, right? Nothing you haven't heard before. Here's the thing that's interesting. $30. $30. It's the Wise, W-Y-Z-E cam at wisecam.com. Now, again, I haven't reviewed it, so I'm not saying buy it. I'm just saying it's interesting that they can sell it for $30. <laughs> a high-def 1080p camera for $30. It's, uh, it's pretty cool looking. But what I, what I think the moral of this story is not so much that this camera is good or bad or, you know, you should run out and get it or whatever. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just kind of impressed at the price. And what it tells me is that we've gotten to the point now where... Uh, Chi you know, uh, Chinese manufacturing has gotten so efficient and so cheap that you can conceive of something like this uh, arranged with manufacturers in China. And by the way, they all have their offices in uh, Silicon Valley in New York, so you don't have to even go to China. You know, you can talk to their representatives there, and uh, and then they can uh, and then they can <laughs> they can crank it out. To your specification, and you can sell it for as little. I mean, thirty dollars for this is mind-boggling. So, you know, part of it is uh, I think a lot of this actually comes from the iPhone. Believe it or not, you can thank Apple for all of this because when they started making the iPhone in, in China, Shenzhen, China, with the Foxconn company there, uh, you know, in two thousand back in two thousand seven. This was all pretty new stuff. China had already manufactured a lot of stuff, but it was kind of junky stuff, right? It wasn't, it wasn't great stuff. It was kind of like, um, yeah, 
inexpensive kind of cheesy stuff, right? Remember that? Do you remember those days <laughs> where that's, you know, where you considered, well, <laughs> you know, it, 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 they're flooding the world with primary colored plastic doodads. It's not that way anymore. And I think the iPhone was the first time they were really challenged. Apple threw a lot of its skill and expertise into developing manufacturing expertise in China, in Shenzhen, China, uh, manufacturing special equipment. And once they got to a large enough scale, you know, they were, they were doing things no one else could do, milling aluminum bodies in great quantity. There's a billion iPhones out there, active, currently in use. They've sold even more than that, but a billion, all cranked out of those factories in Shenzhen, China. In the process, the components, the things you put in these phones got also benefited down the line, right? The, the suppliers got good and fast at manufacturing these. And, of course, good and fast usually means less expensive. The cameras, hmm, the accelerometers, the, all of the things that uh, make up, you know, most of the modern electronics from our, our, our day were kind of developed and, and, and streamlined by Apple in China. And then going out all over the world. And this, I, so to me, this is, that's the moral of this wise camp, W-Y-Z-E. $30. And wise is in Washington State, Kirkland, Washington. But, uh, but I'm sure these are made in, I can probably look on the box, they're made in China, right? It's the same thing. It's, the, it's that amazing manufacturing skill that they've developed over time. Just fascinating to me. They say 14 days free cloud storage. You get two weeks. So you don't even pay a subs. So you might say, oh, well, $30, but they're selling that at a loss because they're going to make it up in subscription like everybody else, like Nest does and everybody else does with their security cameras. No, free cloud storage for two weeks. Night vision. 8X digital zoom. I mean, <laughs> this has all the features of a much more, and of course, an iPhone app and a, Android app, but mostly an iPhone, I think an iPhone app. I just find that fascinating. I think this is one of the reasons the world is both changing and there's a lot more junk because it's easier to make all sorts of odd stuff that, and just see, does anybody want it? Maybe they will. And then again, maybe they won't, maybe they won't. Uh, I, I, you can, you can look around and there's all sorts of stuff like this. Chip prices of laptops falling. And some of this also is because digital, it's the nature of digital, that it gets faster, smaller, lower power, and lower cost all at the same time. And that's un kind of unheard of, right? Usually faster and smaller or better, think of a Swiss watch, is more expensive. Cars haven't gotten less expensive, they've gotten more expensive. Digital technology is the only thing that's getting less expensive over time. You can get, it used to be, I mean, not so long ago, that the laptop you wanted was about $2,500. And still the high-end ones, if they're from Apple, <laughs> can come in at that. But you can get a pretty darn good laptop for well under $1,000. And you can get, if you're willing to make a few sacrifices in quality, you can get a completely usable laptop for a couple of hundred dollars. That's amazing. Well, it's an interesting world we live in. And this is what we talk about on the show. If you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, you want to talk about something, 8888 Ask Leo. I guess I'll set this wise cam up during the show. We'll see if we can get it to uh, to pan, tilt, and zoom and work all of that stuff, do all that stuff. Feels a little, a little cheesy, but 30 bucks. <laughs> 8888 Ask Leo. Let's talk uh, high tech, you and me. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're going to take a break, come back with your calls. Give us a ring, 8888-ASK. Leo Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guru, coming up in 10 minutes. Lots more fun. Stay right here. Schmoke on the Vata. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, Kim Schaffer. She's here, the tech gal, answering the phones. Hello, Kim. Good morning. How are you? I am wonderful. I'm basking in the glory of a you have Warriors win last Oh, night. wasn't that fun? Now I feel bad, all the Cleveland listeners. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> sorry. But it just sorry, wasn't but your back -to -back year. Back-to-back 
back to back and a sweep. It was yeah. pretty awesome. It was fun to watch. I must say. I must say. Well, now that uh, did you did you party all night? No. 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 Okay. I knew I had to come here. <laughs> I had Smart to behave woman. myself. <laughs> I went to bed after the game. <laughs> yes. <what did> I? <laughs> okay. What uh, what should we do here? Let's uh, let's take some calls. You've been yeah. answering the phones, I think. Yes. Let's we'll stay local here for okay. a minute. Bob in San Jose is going to be resetting his phone, and he's afraid certain things might not get backed up. And well, I understand how that is. Your assistance line. Yes. For. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Bob. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? Oh, I'm well. How are you? I'm doing very well. Good. So I have my phone, and it's beginning to act a little weird. Batteries are going down, you know, like a half a day I'm losing my battery. So something's running. I can't find it. I removed apps. So I'm just going to reset it back to factory. How old is the phone? Oh... Two years. Okay. It's a uh, LG G5 with the removal of batteries. Uh, LG G5. Yeah. Okay. You know, it right. might and be. I'm I mean, yeah, I, it's worth away. resetting. That's fine. But it might be that the uh, battery's worn out. Uh, two years is fast, but not unheard of for a battery to wear out that fast. You know, it, the way it works is the number of full recharges that you get on it. So um, it could be that it's worn out. But I would, you know, reset it maybe. Whoa! That was... I figured that'd be a good test is to reset it, but I've got authenticators on here, Google Authenticator and a couple of more. Yeah. Uh, for other sites that require you to use their authenticator. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure what happens when I reset the phone and I reinstall these authenticators. It will not remember. Retain my information? No, it will not. Okay. So with authenticators, it depends. Of course, some authenticators. I use one called Authy that allows you to, um, uh, ha you know, have you have an account that allows you to save these. And then that, and the reason I use that is because I am always setting up new phones, so that would be a pain in the butt. But I learned this lesson with Google Authenticator the first time. Remember, I don't know if you remember when you set up your accounts. And by the way, I give you a big gold star and a hug for doing two-factor authentication. <laughs> You're absolutely uh, smart to do that, and everybody should do yeah, that. Thank you. Yep. So when you first set it up, you got you uh, like uh, you you got a QR code from the site that you wanted to add. Correct. Yeah, and that QR code actually represents just a long sixty-four digit number, something like that. That's your secret number, that is in effect a, a generated password from that site. Those authenticators take that number, they store that number in the authenticator, and they hash it with the time of day to get you that six-digit number. And the reason that works is because you're, in effect, saying, based on the current time of day, here's a one-time-only password, good for 30 seconds, that reflects that longer 64-digit code. And the, and the website that you're logging into or the app you're logging into can make the same calculation. It knows your secret code. It does the same time of day calculation and says, yep, that matches. That secret code is what's in the QR code. And unless you somehow make a note of it, save the QR code or write down that long number, uh, you're out of luck. Once you reset, you'll reinstall the authenticator and they'll say, okay, we're ready to add accounts. Right. And you'll go, uh, how do I add it? Well, you go back to that site and you generate a QR code. Now, if you do that, that's fine. But, uh, you know, it's going to reset everything. So that's not necessarily the end of the world. It may require you to put a new password in. You know, it just varies. I use, I use it on LastPass, for instance. And LastPass will show you that code again. Google, I'm trying to remember if Google will show it to you again or make you change it. I can't remember what Google does. So in general, it's kind of a pain in the butt because you have to go through it and redo it, basically. That's why I recommend next time use Authy. Now you can go in, I think you can go into your Google Authenticator and you might be able to get those uh, secret keys. If you can, then then all is well. Just get that out before you reset the phone. I have to I have to unplug this camera. It's driving me crazy saying ready to connect, <laughs> ready to connect. Uh, sorry about that noise yeah. in the background. Yeah, so I'm, I'm figuring out that I, I'm in here looking at it and I probably should write down what these things are. You know, I mean, I got Can you like see them in seven the, or eight of them in here. Not the six digit code. There's a, there's no, no, no. But the what they are, you know, I've got like, you know, Coinbase and blockchain. Yeah, info. yeah. 
Uh, yeah. I, you know, I Look probably and see. wouldn't remember that I even had those. I don't know? remember if Authenticator I, I, will show you those uh, those long secret keys. If it will, that's all you need to reset it. So if you can see yeah, that in the authenticator, like yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I, my problem is when I, I first discovered this by doing what you are about to do without preparing. So I don't remember if there was a way to recover it. I just had to go back through it. So uh, you're going to, if I'm going to do this and reset it. So going to Authy is probably go to Authy. It's free. Yeah. And security experts will say, well, yes. Okay. But then somebody else is storing those secret codes, which means they have, potentially have the authenticator codes but with authy you encrypt the codes with a with a password known only to you they don't have access to your code so i trust that i think that's fine and since it is really just part of a two-part authentication process it's not the end of the world if there was a rogue employee to authy or authy leaked them or something like that but but in general i right. think you're all right i think i yeah, think I the authy is safe and i've been using that as a result so what happens is you'll have a authy login the next phone, you'll log into Authy. It'll say, okay, but you need to give me your decryption password, which you've stored somewhere like LastPass. You enter that decryption exactly. password, and then all of your um, Authy uh, codes come back, so you don't have to redo this. Yeah, because, you know, I use LastPass. I do all that stuff. Good man. Good man. You know, They're a sponsor, I should And I'm trying to convince that. everybody else to at least use a password authenticator or manager, even if it's not LastPass. Right on. But at least use one. Well, and you know what? I'm glad you're, you're for instance, Bob, you're storing your Bitcoin or your or your uh, cryptocurrency in there in the Bitcoin account. Really important you secure that because uh, that's money, you know? <laughs> it's, right, yeah. So, so I should secure it like yours? <laughs> Mine's too secure. I can't remember the password. Yes, yeah, I know. You're giving me a hard time, but you're right. I deserve it. Seven Bitcoin. They're not lost. They're just sitting on my hard drive. One of these days, I'll unlock them. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't. Mean oh, it's painful. <laughs> no, no. I like to be an example for uh, for our audience. Don't lose your password, but do secure those accounts with two factor because that means a bad guy, even if he got your password, still couldn't steal your, you know, your wallet. He'd have to have the the second factor as well. Correct. Yeah, I think cool. that's, uh, yeah, and you might as well try resetting it. But if it doesn't fix it, the good news is you got the last LG that you could replace the battery. I got new batteries coming. They're supposed to be here Monday. Yeah. Maybe I would maybe wait until uh, till you get the new batteries just to before you reset, just to see. You can yeah, wait till Monday. I out because it began to get a little fat. So oh, that's not good. That's yeah, not that's good. that's not good at all. Yeah, if those batteries are swelling, yeah, don't take them out. Yeah, don't yeah, use that them. That one I tossed and, and immediately put out in the middle of my backyard so that it wasn't <laughs> near anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember, those all have to go to electronics recycling depots. Yep, exactly. Good man. No, I, I, I do know that. Uh, Bob, and I'm you, you obviously pay attention, and I like that about you. Thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Scott Wilkinson coming up next. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, star of our show, <laughs> Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guru. Hello, Scotty. Hey, Leo. It's good to see you. Thanks. You too. Welcome. So you saw, okay, two things. One, you've reviewed the new LG OLED TV. This is the 2018 yeah. model. Correct. And? Beautiful. Wonderful. Nice. Highly recommended. Highly <laughs> recommended. Highly recommended. I gave it our top award, the AVS Forum top choice. So, uh, you know, what's not to like about OLED, right? Is it, but I guess the question for me, given that I bought two years ago, bought the same one, is it a lot better? I would not. I, I would not say a lot. No. Okay. Um, I would say the OLEDs year by year get incrementally better, and this one has some new features that are that are in fact pretty cool. One is they've improved the video processing significantly. Okay. Now, the video processing was all were already good. Okay. And they've made it better, quite a bit better. Um, so what so, does that make a difference for? SD well, and HD yeah, pictures? Yeah, exactly. Uh, in terms of upscaling from HD to UHD. This is a 4K or Ultra HD resolution, high dynamic range, um, 
And, you know, every year they improve it a little bit. I think this one might have a little higher peak brightness than last year. So the scalers uh, are used with lower quality images. Correct. Does it also, Which, does it also scale non-HDR to HDR? Yes, it does. It does. So it, it will it, expand the dynamic range as well. Correct. Correct. That's a that's an artificial expansion, and you know some people might object to it, uh, <clears throat> but others won't. And it certainly, even the SDR, if you don't expand it, and mostly what I in my review I did not d use this expansion function mm -hmm. because in both cases HDR and SDR standard dynamic range. The black level is not specified. It's not in the spec. So the black level can be whatever it is. And as we know, uh, OLED TVs, the black level is phenomenal. It's pure black. Yeah. So even SDR looks better on an OLED than most other TVs because that black level is so low. So I found SDR, Blu-ray, for example, uh, to look really good really good uh with even without this 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 expansion now one of the biggest features that i actually spent a lot of time on is a, kind of a geeky thing called auto cal so you and i have talked about calibration right where you make sure the tv is as close to what the standards and specifications for video say they should be and normally that takes a lot of time uh, for a calibrator to go in and do that manually. Well, this year, LG has partnered with a company called SpectraCal, which makes one of the uh, standard calibration software packages called CalMan. And now, with that col collaboration, you can basically set it up. You have to still have to have a meter, you know, a, a hardware meter that's looking at the TV, but it basically does it automatically. And it does a remarkably good job. Hmm. Uh, we found that... Um, you mean you guys are out of business? <laughs> well, not quite, no. No? Oh. Uh, <clears throat> That's a relief. I mean, yes, for... I mean, you still have to have a meter. And a meter can cost anywhere from uh, a few hundred bucks, a couple oh, hundred it, bucks Oh, this doesn't anyway. calibrate without a meter. Correct. You still need a meter and you still need the software. <laughs> ah. So you're still going to spend several hundred dollars on that or pay a calibrator to come in and do it. Right. Uh, uh, you know, so it makes the calibrator's job easier. Got it. Or more efficient. So it's basically say. just building in uh, those images that it, you use to calibrate, basically. Well, not not even images. No, it 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 basically collaborates or com communicates with uh, with Calman with the software to to make a a, a uh, bi directional communication an iterative system. Oh, so it it displays something. Calman says, "Oh, it looks like this." Uh, let me uh, make this adjustment and displays oh, wow. it. Oh, look. so it's sort of automated once you get this this the uh, hardware. This correct. Oh, Correct. that's kind of cool. So, which is very cool. Yeah, uh, I like that quite a bit. Yeah, uh, there were some complaints on AVS forum about certain abnormalities, and in fact, the good people of AVS forum, the good members of AVS forum, discovered a bug in the calibration software in this process, which SpectraCal is now correcting. So. We're always very happy when uh, very picky <laughs> uh, calibrators and users, very technically inclined users, see that, see a bug, and report it. And SpectraCal is very responsive and said, oh, yeah, that is a bug. We'll fix that. That's nice. <clears throat> Which is really nice. Now, the bug only affects certain colors, colors at what are called 100% saturation. So that's the, the most saturated color that the TV can produce. It actually exaggerates that a little bit. But anything less than 100%, it doesn't. And content, real-world content, rarely includes any colors at that 100% saturation. So most people aren't even going to see it. Even if they run AutoCal in CalMan and do it, they're not going to see that, except in very rare cases. Okay. So I'm not it's, – it's a minor bug. But SpectraCal's fixing it anyway because AVS Forum members found it, and it's true. It's a bug. So um, 
you know, it's this this all this tech, as you know, it, you, you release something. This is the first time they've done it, too. Well, the second time they did it with Samsung as well, but at a different level. And so at this level, it's the first time they've done it. You're bound to get some bugs, right? You, yeah. you don't get it yeah. perfectly right the first time out. Well, so they, they were able to fix it. Actually, I always get I'm yeah. encouraged when you have something that can be firmware upgradable like that. That's a really mm. good sign. Do, right, do or in this case, even software upgradable. I mean, well, it is yeah. firm. But I mean, did you have to do anything, or do they push that out? Uh, no, they. You, you basically, if it, it's in Calman, it's in the software. Oh, it's Calman's. Uh, upgrade. It's not. It's uh, not in LG. Oh, not LG had a couple of bugs too, and they've already pushed out a couple of. So they are updates. able to push out updates. See, I yes. always look for that yes. in anything internet yes. connected. Uh, yep. Automated updates are huge these days. If yeah, they find yeah, bugs. yeah. Good. Absolutely, yeah. So this, they do that. how much? What's the price for this then? Uh, the fifty-five incher, which I was, which I was looking at, is the list price is twenty-eight hundred bucks, but it's on uh, promotional price on the website now for twenty-five. Boy, they've really come down. So would they really be, have. If down. you wanted to save, you probably could save a thousand bucks getting last year's model. I would guess. I would guess, not, maybe not a thousand, but certainly a, a significant amount. And you, that you would could probably be okay if the biggest. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, I'm sure they're probably putting last year's model on deeper discounts so that, you know, they'll sell the new ones. Right. Or they'll sell out of the old ones. They'll sell out of their inventory. Right. But uh, but they're still going to get a fine TV. With is this available model. now? Yes. What does the say yep. the model number again so people can? Uh, it's the C8, uh, letter C, number eight, meaning 2018. Uh, twenty five hundred bucks for the fifty five inch, uh, thirty five hundred bucks for the sixty five inch, and if you really want to spend money, the seventy seven incher is nine grand. Wow! Still, you know, compared to what they were a couple of years ago, even wow. uh, OLEDs of that size, that's not bad. Yeah, no, that's not bad. This sounds like is this? Would you say the TV to get if uh, price were no absolutely. object? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In my opinion, is there a better is, TV out there? There are brighter TVs out there. The LCDs, LCDs are can be brighter, yeah. but I think this is plenty bright enough for virtually all applications. Very nice. Scott Wilkinson. Find his full review at the AVS Forum site, avsforum.com. He's editor there. And uh, you probably are you going to review Oceans 8 there as well? Uh, I am. Just about to put it up. Okay. So you can catch his review of that as well. Thank you, Scott. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Back to the phones we go right after this. Yeah, this is pretty cool. See, I can I can steer this around. I've reached the end. That's really cool. I can talk. Hey, hey, knock it off. Hey, get out of my, get out I'm of my talking. yard. I'm, get out of my yard. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's got a timestamp on it. That's nice. That's neat. All right. Scotty, it's all yours, my friend. Thank you so very much. Yeah, Graveyard Tuba. What's grant nine grand between friends? <clears throat> Twisted Mister has a 65-inch Panasonic Plasma. If it's a late model Panasonic Plasma, it's a beautiful set. In a 12 by 14 bedroom, and it looks just looks, quote, normal to me, I guess, because you've had it there for a while. Um, Red Dog says, I'm sitting 15 feet away from my TV, thinking 75 inches. I would agree. So Vizio M series or Samsung QLED? Oh boy. That's a good question. Uh, because they both have their advantages and disadvantages. I would guess if you're looking at the Vizio M series, you're probably on a somewhat of a budget, which means that you're probably not going to get this year's uh, Q9 uh, QLED from Samsung uh, because that's the only one. Uh, possibly the Q8, I'd have to remember now, but I'd have to go research it. But at least the Q9 has what's called FALD, F-A-L-D, Full Array Local Dimming. Uh, the other Samsungs have what's called edge lighting. So the LEDs, the backlight, are around the edge of the TV and not all four edges. I forget I think it might be two, top and bottom in this case. Last year it was only bottom, and that was somewhat problematic. The Vizios have fault. All of them do. Vizio made a commitment to that technology, and I applaud them for it. The um, So the, uh, 
there's a full array of LEDs behind the screen. And they can dim or brighten in groups, in zones, uh, to make the, improve the contrast and make the blacks deeper and make the screen more uniform uh, in, in very uniform kinds of scenes. So those are all very strong positives for the Vizio. And unless you're going for the Samsung Q9, if you are, then that's probably a better TV. Um, but if you're not, if you're going for the Q7 or lower, uh, then it's I'm pretty sure it's edge lit. And truth be told, I'd probably go for the Vizio because of that fault. The Vizio, I've, I've reviewed two Vizios last year. And I both gave them a recommended, not a top choice, because the blacks weren't as good as I would want. Of course, I'm used to OLED, so that's part of the problem. Very few LCD TVs get as black as OLED, or as deep a black as OLED. Uh, but still, the Vizios were only mediocre in that regard, and I'm a sucker for black level. I just love deep blacks. So uh, still in all... I guess, depending on your budget, if you can get a 75-inch Q9, then that's what I would recommend. If you can't, then I'd probably go for the Vizio. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> Chumley can't find a new plasma now, though. That's true. They don't make them anymore. No one does. Uh, they just went away, just went away altogether. User 15, everyone brags about TCL. TCL is surprising. Can Here you we stick go. around for the top? You bet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. If you want to call and talk, and we could do all that right now. 888-827-5536. On the line, uh, waiting to get on to get their moment in the sun. Let's see who it is. It's line one, Ron in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hi, Ron. Hey Leo, how are you today? Well, I'm great. How are you? Pretty good. Hey, Leo, got, got an issue. I was going to try to get in for the uh, screensavers, but I've inadvertently done something in my Windows 10, out, um, and I got Outlook 2016, where when I, down, when I look at my emails, all the thumbnails, they're just the graphic placeholder. Ah, you're, they're missing, huh? They're missing, but I've gone through, I've searched the Internet, and I, I've gone in and I told Outlook to download the uh, the graphic, but it it won't. I'm thinking I may have inadvertently turned off some authority for a domain or something. So I didn't know if you had. So any tell ideas. me, tell me, uh, what these thumbnails are of attachments. What are the thumbnails of? No, you know, you know where, where you you open the email and you know, it may be the graphic for, um, you know, um, B and H photo or, or or things like that See. that are in stream. It's it's next to the address. It's the photo of the account, or it's in the actual body of the email. It's in the body of the yeah. email. Yeah. Okay. So what happened is that's a dangerous, dangerous thing, and Outlook disables it by default. The reason being, uh, well, a few reasons. Uh, one, literally, viewing emails like that can't actually infect your computer if there's flaws in Outlook or flaws in your computer. There's It's also used for marketing. Often marketing emails contain invisible images, one dot images, pixels. And the marketing people monitor the server when they see each pixel is unique to each individual emailer. When they see that you viewed the email, they go, oh, we got a live one here. So it's a way for, you know, if you've ever seen a service that says, know when your email was read, that's how that does that. And so that's turned off by default now in Outlook. You can, you can enable it, but uh, you should understand what you're doing when you enable it, that that's, that's what you're potentially turning on. And you do it in the Trust Center. So you need to go to Outlook Options, and you're going to change the Trust Center settings. Okay. okay. So, uh, and there, that's why they put it in the trust center, <laughs> because you're saying, I trust that no one would send me an email with anything malicious in it. Yeah, I, I looked, I mean, I saw that. I mean, I told it to download the, download the images and, and knowing, knowing the. What, in the trust center, in the attachment handling, there's a checkbox that says, turn off attachment preview. That's what you're missing. When you don't see anything, there's no preview of the attachment. You're still getting the attachment, 
But the preview show. So, for instance, you said B and H has a little logo in its signature, right? Well, well that, that or, or or the ad itself, you know, where you yeah. get the B and H. Those ad. images are da are actually attachments. They're part of the attachments of the file. But Outlook is for your security disabling it. You have to go in the Trust Center under Attachment Handling and turn on Attachment Preview. You have to okay. disable the disable. <laughs> And they okay. and they started doing that not so long ago, and that's probably what the confusion is. You you you're used to seeing it, but they but they stopped doing that because it's actually dangerous. So uh, you know, one of the things we're realizing is, and I've always thought this: HTML email in general is dangerous. HTML email is the the idea that it's really a web page that's being sent to you. Email to be safe, email should be pure text. Text can infect you. Text can't give you a link that looks like it's to a legitimate site, but has hidden beneath it a, an address that is not legitimate. You know, so it's it's with, for instance, HTML email that a, a spoofer, a fisher, can send you an email that looks like it's from your bank with the bank's logo and everything, and a warning saying, uh, you know, we've detected fraud on your account. Please click this link. And log in to make sure that, uh, you know, you intended these charges or whatever. And the link, highlighted in red right there in the body of the message, says, you know, Bank of America, Trust Center, or whatever. It doesn't say badguys.com, but that's what it leads to. And at badguys.com, you'll get a page that looks exactly like your bank's login. And you'll say, oh, gosh, I'm worried somebody's making fraudulent charges. And you'll log into your bank. And by doing so, you've handed your credentials over. So that's how this works. HTML email, that's one of many attacks. There's even more subtle ones because, unfortunately, uh, due to bugs in software, HTML, HTML email can also contain, in effect, malevolent payloads, malware payloads. It, we most recent one uh, uh, decrypts encrypted email. Because of a flaw in the way, uh, it's quite a clever attack, and the flaw in the way that uh, many email clients, including Outlook, render HTML email. HTML email is dangerous. It's giving all the functionality of a web page to your email client. And unfortunately, just previewing the email activates it. You don't even need to open the message. You just, you know, how in your Outlook you have a preview pane as you scroll down through the messages. That preview is really rendering the full page. So of late, email clients, including Outlook, have tried to make this more safe. And one of the ways they do it is turning off attachment preview. And so that's off by default now. You can turn it on in the Trust Center. But I would be very careful. If you're going to do it, you need to understand, uh, you know, what's going on here. Because it is, it is potentially somewhat risky. Somewhat terribly. I actually, because of that, I don't use Outlook. I stick exclusively to email programs that don't do HTML email because they're dangerous. It's dangerous. It's not good for you. It's a bad idea. And isn't that depressing? <laughs> that's, that's the fact of the matter. It's a bad idea. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. On we go to line two. Dennis, Oceanside, California. Hi, Dennis. Hello, Leo. Let me put you on, get you off speakerphone. Hang on one second, please. Sure. <laughs> he got me off speakerphone, but he also by accident hung up. So call me back. Jeff in Marshall, Illinois. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Leo. It's great to talk to you. I've been following you since ZDTV days. Oh, it's 20 years now. Yeah. Amazing, huh? Were you a kid yeah. when you started watching? Uh, no, I was probably around 20 or so. Right. I don't, yeah. But you have a career in IT now, I see. Yes, I'm an IT guy, and one of my customers has one of these uh, surveillance systems, you know, with the big DVR and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's got an HDMI output on it, and they want to view that on their TV in their office, which is going to be about a 200-foot run. Okay. And I have come up with a couple solutions, but I wanted, wanted to get from you which is the best. Balins. Um, you probably have heard yeah, of Balins. Yes. It stands for, or short for balance, unbalance. And it's a way to make, you know, HDMI gets flaky after, uh, you know, maybe 20 feet, 30 feet. 
150 feet, you'd really have a lot of ghosting and, and issues. So what a Balin does is extends the run of video cables by putting it over Ethernet. But you have to have a, a transceiver at both ends that converts the data into another format. It's not Ethernet, but it's another format, sends it down the Ethernet wire, and picks it up on the other end and turns it back into HDMI. If you go to monoprice.com, search for B-A-L-U-N or HDMI, B-A-L-U-N. I've used them. It works great. You can go hundreds and hundreds of feet. I don't know what the practical limit is, but it's a lot longer than HDMI. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thanks for listening all these years. More of your calls coming up right after this. Yeah. All right. It works. It does what it says it's supposed to do. It's following me around, but it's not exactly quiet. You could maybe even heard a little. Nee, 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 nee. But, you know, I mean, what do you want for 30 bucks? That's pretty cool. So there you go. I'm going to say it works. I, I like the image, and I, uh, it's cool. I'm having fun playing with it. Now, that's the Wise Cam. $30 for the Wise Cam pan. Wow. We send you back to Scott Wilkinsonian. <laughs> who is already in progress. Thank you. Yes. By the way, uh, you were you were uh, right about Balin's uh, using Ethernet cables, Cat5 right. cables. But not Ethernet protocol, huh? Correct, correct. Or the Balin can also use fiber optics. Ooh, that would probably be more expensive, though. It would. Yeah. It is more expensive. All right. Well, there you go. The seal of approval from Scott <laughs> Wilkinson. <laughs> so, hey, everybody. Glad to see you all. Let's see here. I, I know there were a few things. Uh, <clears throat> Maverick 56. Any thoughts on micro LED? Many thoughts on micro LED. I love it. Uh, this technology is phenomenal. So for those of you who don't know, what it is is a an array of LEDs, tiny, tiny, tiny ones, hence the name micro LED. Uh, and there's a tiny red one, a green one, and a blue one that form a pixel. And those are then spread out across the entire screen. This is a direct view video display technology. So it's not transmissive like LCD where light has to pass through an LCD layer in order to make the picture. Uh, it's more like OLED or plasma, which is called an emissive technology. So it's a direct view. It's, it's the, the, the little pixels make their own light and they shine their own light into the world. And because they are shining directly into the world, they can be controlled as to how bright they are. And that's how they form the picture. Now, micro LED technology has come a long way in the last even just few years. Uh, Samsung now has something called The Wall, which is, uh, I think they introduced it recently for professional uh, applications, like, say, you know, digital signage advertising out in the world. Um, but they also intend for it to be a home product. And they showed at CES a 146-inch version of it, which you put on the wall. It's called The Wall. You put it on the wall. <laughs> And it's a 4K HDR uh, video TV, basically. And the way all these systems work is that they are tiled. So there's a, a standard tile, uh, maybe, I don't know, a foot square roughly, uh, embedded with these micro LEDs. And you basically assemble a screen of the size you want. And they are tremendously bright. I mean, they, these, this is going to put projectors out of business eventually because projectors are not very bright, typically. I mean, there are some really high brightness ones, but even those, micro LED is going to put those to shame uh, because they are going to be so much brighter. Now, do you want that much brightness in a home, in your home theater? Probably not. So you dial it back a little bit, but you have some headroom which is, uh, I think, really important. You never want to exercise technology, any technology really, to the extremes of its ability all the time. And that's basically kind of what you're doing with LED, uh, with uh, OLED anyway, is you know, you're pushing it pretty hard, especially in HDR when the brightness goes up. And uh, LG and Sony and the people who make uh, OLEDs uh, work very hard to 
eke out as much brightness as they possibly can. Because, as I said earlier, OLED TVs are not as bright as most LCD TVs. And that's because they have a, LCDs have a backlight. And you can make that backlight just crank out the light. Uh, and as a result, LCD TVs, HDR capable models in particular, are generally brighter than OLEDs. And that's one of their advantages. I myself don't find that to be a problem. It, it's important if you're in a very well-lit environment. So I would not put OLEDs in a sports bar or uh, you know other places where there's going to be a lot of light uh, because they're just not going to be able to compete with that. LCDs will. But if you're at home, the brightness of an OLED in HDR is plenty, certainly plenty for me. And these micro LEDs are going to be even tremendously brighter than LCD TVs are today. So as a result, you're going to dial it back. And as a result of that, you're not going to be pushing those LEDs to their limits, which means they're going to last longer and they're not going to generate as much heat. So I like LCD quite a bit. I mean, micro LED. <clears throat> uh, Graveyard Tuba is asking, uh, does Dolby Atmos have rigid setup requirements in commercial theaters like THX did? Uh, yeah, more or less it does. Uh, they definitely want uh, the side speakers. To, well, the side speakers more or less as they are now. The overhead speakers, they specify being in two rows from the front of the theater to the back. Uh, so, you know, that's at least, I, I don't know if that's actually a specification that they say thou shalt always do it exactly this way. It makes the most sense to do it that way, and that's the way I've seen it in every theater, Atmos theater I've ever been in, commercial Atmos theater. So I don't know if it's an actual hard requirement or not, but it's the way everybody does it. So effectively, I guess it is. Uh, let's see. Um, I had a couple other questions here. Oh, user 0898. Uh, does Japan broadcast in the equivalent of NTSC 3.0? It's actually ATSC 3.0. Or is it uh, is the standard globally set? You know that's a that's a pretty good question. I I don't have a definitive answer for it. I'm pretty sure that it is more or less a global standard. The people around the world are going to uh, implement ATSC 3.0, um, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I do know that Japan is already experimenting with 8K broadcasting, and so is Korea, and. That is probably not using ATSC 3.0. ATSC 3.0, it, it's possible to support 8K in, but there's no definition of how to do that. So I suspect Japan and Korea are uh, using some sort of proprietary or prototype system to carry out those experiments. That's uh, the story there, as far as I know. Oh, Graveyard Tuba had a great idea. Compare, Do a side-by-side -side comparison of a calibrated plasma and a calibrated OLED. I thought that's a, that's a great idea. The problem there is the comparison would be somewhat limited because plasma doesn't do any more than 1080p resolution, and it does not do HDR, only does SDR. So you'd have to compare them only on those two criteria. I mean, you'd have to limit it to that. It would have to be Blu-ray uh, or broadcast TV and nothing in 4K UHD or HDR. Um, but if you did that, if you limited it to that, it would be very interesting to see because plasma got very deep blacks. I think OLED gets deeper. But there you go. Thank you, Scott. My pleasure. Have see a good you next one. Week. You bet. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, Smart watches, 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. 888 827 5536. Toll free from anywhere in the US or Canada website, techguylabs.com. And while you're there, go into our chat room. Check out the link to our chat room. Because during the show, you can join a bunch of the kids in the in the back of the class, the wise acres, and uh, and make comments and suggestions. But I also consider uh, the people in the chat room 
at irc.twit.tv as, uh, as kind of the um, team tech guy. They're helping us out. So when you're calling and asking a question, you're getting answers not just from me, but also from a lot of smart people in our chat room. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. On we go to line one. Dennis, he's in Oceanside. Hello, Dennis. Hi, Leo. Let's try this again. I am so sorry. No. I dropped you like a rock. <laughs> about hey, I'm glad you were able to get back in. That's yeah, great. Yeah. yeah, me too. Anyway, hi. Um, how is it? How are you doing today? I'm, it, Oceanside is gorgeous. Is it? There. Oh, how nice. The sun finally came out. How the nice. June gloom broke. So, hey, um, I talked to you a couple of weeks ago, actually in April, and uh, it had to do with a um, replacing a solid state uh, a hard drive with a solid state drive and upgrading the RAM on an older HP G sixty two laptop. Okay. And uh, using Crucial products, yep. and uh, I just want to let you know it went smooth as anything. So it was good, and I didn't have to call in. And the chat room had said, "Oh, he'll be calling you back." <laughs> No, that's really good news. No, that was good it's, news. It's, a, it's a wonderful upgrade, right? Because yes. uh, it, has, it has probably, I have probably 75% faster on everything and shut down and start up are 90% nice. faster. So, nice. Anyway, I'm in, the, I'm in the market now. I need a smartphone. I'm finally getting ready to get rid of my flip phone. How about that? Wow. I'm working with a Star Trek flip phone, a CDM something. Um, <laughs> I, I don't even know what it is anymore. How long have you had that? I think since uh, 2008. Wow. I believe, something like yeah, that. Yeah, so the first, uh, I mean, smartphones have been around for a while, but the first iPhone came out in 2007. Right. So. so I, it was at the beginning of that smartphone revolution. Yeah, so I that's got, not unreasonable. And you're a frugal fellow. It is the, the one I'm, it's the Verizon Wireless CDM 8910. <laughs> yeah, shiny silver. It still has the pull up antenna. <laughs> oh, even better. You know, that was a little bit of a. By the way, I just looked up uh, CBM eighty nine ten, and all I could find is a Cuisinart. So it is oh, so. No, CBM. <laughs> this, David Mike. It was. It's <laughs> so old. Okay. All right. There you go. That'll work better. Uh, it's an audio vox. So yeah. they took out. Uh, you know, the phone industry decided that uh, we did not like extendable antennas. They remember they break and. Yeah. You know they're inconvenient. They kind of look dorky, but the replacement, which is an antenna in body, is not nearly as good. So one thing I should warn you about if you move to a smartphone, you may be disappointed in reception. Now, you're on Verizon, yes. the Oceanside. You're probably fine. Okay, yeah. So far, in fact, this, this old phone, uh, it, they, they keep upgrading the network, so I'm getting better service. When yeah. I first moved into this house uh, several years ago, when we got the phones, we moved to the house, and we couldn't use the phones in the house. Yep. <laughs> we yep. had to go outside. Or so, yeah, go just, to be, just to be prepared that in areas where it's marginal, where you're getting one or two bars on that phone, you may get zero okay. on, a, on a modern smartphone. Well, so what are you thing. looking for in a smartphone? I'm looking for a rugged smartphone. I don't care how pretty it is, and I've been looking at the... Uh, Kirosera DuraForce PPO Rugged phone camera action, and it's on the Verizon uh, network. They have they offer them. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is rugged really important to you? Uh, water resistant is. I have a uh, boat in the harbor, so there could be issues of getting wet. So the problem with getting uh, one of these phones mm -hmm. is uh, that. There, Kyocera is not on the cutting edge of technology. Oh. Now you have been on the, <laughs> the uh, other end, of the it. other, <laughs> the dullest of all edges. Yeah. Uh, so that's not the end of the world. But uh, I do with Android. You want to be a little bit careful because uh, older Android is dangerous. Android. So mm. I'm not sure. I'm looking. I'm trying to see on the specs on this. Oh my gosh. I hope this isn't true. On the Kyocera mobile site there, you say this is using Android 5.1, which is ancient. Oh, is it? Yeah. Lollipop. We're really? up to, yeah, we're up to Oreo, L-M-N-O. That's four generations old. So the problem with that is it's probably not getting security patches. Well, that wouldn't be good, would it? Yeah. <laughs> that would be my, my biggest concern. I love it that it's rugged. It's got a fairly big battery, which means you're going to get good battery life. Probably doesn't have a great screen. I see it's got a fairly slow processor. So, you know, it, for your first phone, it might be okay, although I want you to have a great experience. Okay, yeah. 
And um, security on Android is an is a, is an issue. Have you uh, rejected iPhones completely? Is that out of the? No, 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 no I haven't. Uh, I, in fact, that's what I was going to get originally, but now that I listen to you so much and listen to other people talk, it seems like a Android has a lot more opportunity. I like Android, that. but it requires a little more. Um, Care, care in terms of security? Well, I'm probably pretty good at that since I'm running a, a, a computer from 2009 also. <laughs> that one I just upgraded, that HPG. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the nice thing about an iPhone... Okay, first of all, iPhone is dominant in the United States. So okay. you'll have many, many friends who will know what to do if you have an issue. Okay. And that always is an, an issue. It's also fairly easy to use. Either, either a modern iPhone or a modern Android phone... You. First of all, they make many IP67 and 68 uh, waterproof phones. The Samsung, by the way, the other one I might look at is a Samsung S9. Samsung at S9, okay. That, that is waterproof. And then you put that in a ruggedized case, it'll be every bit as waterproof and, and rugged as the DuraForce. Are the Samsung, because that S9, that's a pretty new Samsung, that's right? The, that's the latest Samsung, yeah. Okay. And they're running probably, what, 900 bucks or something like that? Uh, yeah. Okay, this is another issue is price. Yeah. How much they, was that DuraForce? Uh, if I stay with Verizon, I can have it for $308. Okay. Uh, you, you, you could probably get a similar deal on the S9 from them because they're probably subsidizing it. But if not, then I would look at a Moto G6, which okay. is also an excellent phone. You had mentioned those before, and that's yeah. the other thing that I was looking at prior to me finding the Kyocera. What so. you might want to do is just take the, go to the Verizon store, take the latest, if it's a G6 or whatever phone, and put it next to the, the DuraForce and just compare. Yeah, that's the problem with the DuraForce. That's what I thought it was a brand new phone because the stores don't have them in stock right now to look at. You have to order them and have them delivered. It's because nobody's buying them. That's why. Okay, okay, <laughs> makes sense. If you don't have the if you don't have the need and the request, and I guess you don't want to stock them. That's yeah, why right. stock it? Oh, you really got to have it. Construction workers use it. It has push to talk. All right. So it's a very popular with construction. Um, they're they not, show it as far as you know, um, uh, bike riding. Uh, you yeah. know, as far as all that kind but of. But you stuff. can get you can get rugged. You don't you don't you can get a modern phone that's also rugged. In and and one of the ways you do that is you buy, you put it in a a, a rugged case. And there are right. lots of cases. Okay. Which that, which Motorola were you saying? G six is very inexpensive. It's less than that. Okay. Um, you can get there are actually quite a few. Modern Android phones at around four hundred dollars. The One Plus Six is a very nice phone. Who's uh, that made by? Uh, a company called One Plus. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a very nice. There are a lot of good choices out there. I don't think you have to sacrifice. You should not get anything that is running anything less than Android Seven, and ideally, you'd get Android Eight. And so, when the new ones are delivered, they don't up. Date no, and that's that's the reason they're still shipping those with Lollipop is they've never updated it. Oh, well, and then, that's a very yeah. bad sign. I'm probably ruling that out then. Yeah, I so, would. I'm gonna start looking. Well, I'm gonna I don't go want you being happy. Anyway. Go look at the S9, which is gorgeous. What a great camera! I think I already looked at it, and it's like well, it's a piece of jewelry. So it's, yeah, it's, it's only seven hundred some. It's not nine hundred, but uh, okay. it's a piece of jewelry. But you can put it in a strong case, and it is yeah. waterproof. Okay. Wireless charging is convenient. There's a lot of reasons to get a more modern phone. You could put an SD card in it and really expand the memory so you could start storing music and books and pictures and video. I just think a modern phone, especially with Android. iPhone, you can go get an iPhone SE for roughly that price, about 400 and, uh, and that's an older iPhone that Apple um, still sells for the price sensitive. Put that in a... In a you can get waterproof, like a life-proof case. It's waterproof. Uh, it's not the phone is not, but the case is, and uh, you'd, you'd get probably just as much of a rugged phone as you would with a DuraForce. Enjoy your new phone, and of course, I think this time I will be hearing from you again. N nice to talk to you. I'm glad you got back through, Dennis. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We'll take a little tiny, teeny weeny break, and back to the phones we go. 8888 ask Leo. The Tech Eye Podcast brought to you today and many days by the people who brought me to you. Not my mom and dad. <laughs> they were involved. 23 and me. See, 23 and me is about those 23 chromosomes, the pairs of chromosomes, one from my mom and one from my dad that made me who I am, that make you who you are. 
Now through Father's Day, what a great Father's Day gift. Get 30% off every 23andMe DNA kit. There's something about Dad. We don't know what it is, but with 23andMe, you can find out. <laughs> Not only uh, health and wellness traits, like why does Dad have back hair? Well, it's right there in his jeans. <laughs> but also why Dad uh, is more sensitive to coffee or less or, you know, what wellness traits he has, what he's predisposed to, high blood pressure. It's all in there. You can get over 75 detailed online reports about your genetic ancestry, your inherited traits, learn how your genes can influence your health. Ancestry reports include ancestry composition. So I'm 39.1% Irish and, and British, I guess. That's cool, right? Uh, haplogroups, how much Neanderthal? I'm 4% Neanderthal. Turns out that's kind of low. Most of my relatives, my sister is more. <laughs> oh, yeah, my sister did. In fact, uh, last year I sent it for Christmas to my mom and my sister. This year, Dad's getting it for Father's Day. There's also a DNA relative finder tool. I just uh, I just went, uh, got a notification for 23andMe. We found this month 63 new relatives. I guess a lot of people are signing up for 23andMe. Of course, all your privacy is protected. Don't worry. And it's easy to do. There's no blood, no needles, no doctor visit. They just send you a little vial. You spit into it. There's enough DNA in there for them to do the analysis. Results online in about six to eight weeks. Now through June 17th, 30% off every kit, including free gift wrap just for Father's Day. But it doesn't just have to be for Dad. You can get it too. In fact, what a great gift. Say, Dad, I got this for you and I got it for me. And then when we get our report, we're going to share. My mom shared her report with me. It's so cool. 23andme.com slash twit. Right now, 30% off each kit, including gift wrap. 23andme.com slash twit. Quit. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888, ask Leo. We thought we might see, I was talking about the iPhone SE, the least expensive uh, iPhone out there. I think it's a little over $400 uh, at uh, Apple stores and various carriers. It's uh, really an old iPhone 5C, I think, isn't it? It's a little dated, but they put the guts in from an um, iPhone 7. But even that is a little old. We're now up to the iPhone 8. So uh, the iPhone SE is a, a A9-based 4-inch phone that is probably going to be replaced. We thought maybe it would be replaced this week. But, uh, you know, Apple had the event on June 4th. They announced zero new hardware, nothing. Even though they're really due to replace the SE, they're due to replace the, I, uh, the, the MacBook. They're way overdue to replace the MacBook. They're due to re maybe give an update to the uh, iPad. None of that. None of it. So, uh, I don't know what to say. Should you, uh, should you get an SE now or wait? If Apple announces something in the next three or four weeks, generally they're very good about taking the SE back and saying, oh, yeah, you can have the new one. But maybe they're going to wait till September. End of the summer might be the best time to get a new iPhone at this point. An SE. Unless, but you know, if you've had a phone for eight, ten years... <laughs> <laughs> this will seem pretty new to you. Line four, Shell on the line from Menifee, California. Hi, Shell. Hi, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. Uh, I got a question for you. We're looking for a sound system for my son's computer. Yeah. Uh, he is using it, um, well, he's using it to create music here with the FL Studio, but he's also using it for gaming. Nice. So I want something that's going to work for both conditions. Is your son uh, in the house? Uh, yes. You, no, might, not right now. you <laughs> might want to consider, no, no, I mean, it, does he live with you? You might want to consider headphones as opposed to a, <laughs> a big speaker system, but it's up to you. Well, he's, uh, he's going to set it up in my ex-wife's house. So. Oh, good. Oh, right. in that case, let's get you something really loud, <laughs> really <laughs> annoying with big subwoofers. What's your budget? Well, um, if we could start with something Maybe like around 500 or something. Oh, yeah. You, I don't can, know. you can do that. Okay. So okay. the thing to understand with uh, computer sound is you either need to get powered speakers or you'll need to buy an amplifier. Okay. But there are plenty of speakers designed for computer systems nowadays. In fact, computer systems are probably the number one way people listen to stuff. Uh, so there's plenty of them that have power in them. I, my favorite powered speakers are from a company called Audio Engine. 
Okay. And they're having a sale right now for dads and grads, so your your timing is pretty good. They make wireless. I wouldn't get wireless because you sacrifice a little bit with wireless. So I'd get the wired speakers. And they they have some speakers. The A5 Plus are in your in your range, or the A2 Plus. And actually, what you might want to do is look at two uh, a pair of uh, smaller uh, say A2s and a subwoofer. What kind of music is he making? Uh, he makes like techno music and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, he has an output from the sound card, which is an optical output. Would we use that, or would we? Yes, you could. Use... Yes, you could. Okay. Uh, that, that would be preferable, but you still need powered speakers. That's just a digital output from the uh, sound card. So. But the digital output is not going to go directly to the powered speakers, right? Yes, it is. Go... Oh, it is? Yeah. It is? Okay. Yeah, you want to make sure not all powered speakers have optical in. The audio engines do. Do I split it up then? So like nope, I have like you don't a... have to. What you'll probably, what I would recommend is a left and right and a subwoofer. If he's making electronic music, bass is important. He wants the yeah. room to move. Plus, that'll really annoy your ex-wife. So let's. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just assuming. So let's get. Yeah. I would go to AudioEngineUSA.com. I think they make really good, high-quality speakers. Uh, I've used them for computer speakers for years. In fact, it's what I use right now. Is a is the A2 for the left and right. They're small. They can sit right next to the computer. And then underneath the computer, you'll put the subwoofer. The audio uh, from the computer will probably go into, it can go into any of those, but probably go into the subwoofer, which will then go up to the bigger speakers. All three of them are separately powered, so it's not a big deal. And you get very clean, high-quality sound. The subwoofer is important, though, so make sure you include that in your budget when you choose the... Uh, the uh, the okay. setup. Okay. Do you have a recommendation on the subwoofer? Yeah, they or? make them too. I would get their subwoofer, okay. which is two hundred seventy nine bucks. Okay. The S eight and a pair of S twos are two hundred bucks. It keeps you right right in there, right in that five hundred dollar price range. So, how about for gaming? Do I need surround sound for that? Or uh... um, he might say he wants surround sound, but that's going to add some more speakers and a decoder. And so. Okay. Um, Unless your unless his sound card supports surround, I think it's a much more expensive thing. I don't. I think left right with a good sub, it's good. It's best for his music, and it'll be fine for gaming. And then if and then next Christmas, if he wants surround sound, you can add <laughs> you can add two more speakers, uh, left and right uh, rear. rear well, that would that would be two more powered speakers then, same yes. size and that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Although you could go wireless for the surround. That's not too bad. Okay. Yeah. Hey, what's the downside with a wireless? Is it the well, you just or? you get interference. You just it's not quite as good a signal. I think wired is always a better signal. But okay. the, the way this okay. is set up, and this is what I do, is you you've got the two little speakers. I mean, they're really fairly small. They're on the desk. They're on either side of the of the screen, which is you what you want. And okay. then the subwoofer is below the desk or somewhere. It does location is not as important on low end. And that'll give you a really nice bass. And I, I feel like I'm getting excellent sound out of those audio engines. I highly recommend them. I, I think his sound card can generate actually 7.2. Perfect, around. perfect. Yeah, a yeah. lot of sound cards can. And then that means you'd just go back and you'd get more speakers. Well, um, I think the point two means two subwoofers. Yeah, but you don't have to have two. Yeah, you could get two. You don't need two. It's not a big room, is it? No, no, I don't no, no, no. Well, you don't need to. This is what I set my son up. Uh, he was making electronic music, too. And I set him up with this. He loved it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Johnny Jet, he's... Where are you? You're in Canada. I'm in Canada, Toronto. Um, just flew up from Miami this morning with my wife and son. I saw your tweet about your flight on Miami, from Miami. The, the air conditioning was pumping mist into the cabin. Yeah, all this condensation. I mean, it was so hot and humid out. And I've seen this in Southeast Asia often. And, and you see it once in a while around here uh, in the summertime and things like that. But this time it was like super duper. And I, <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not a pilot, so I can't explain exactly what's going on. So I'll ask our pilot. And the, but, and the uh, flight attendant didn't come on and say, oh, you might yeah, notice some they, misting. They, oh, yeah, they definitely did. Because I guess people are saying there's smoke in the cabin. Yeah. Um, and they're like... Uh, no, it's fine. Did they it's say it's perfectly normal? Yeah, yeah. They said it's condensation, condensation and um, it's perfectly normal. But 
I mean, definitely added some atmosphere to our flight. And it, 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 once we took <laughs> off, and once we were, you know, above five thousand or yeah, 10, there's no feet, moisture it, in the air up yeah, there. It was gone. Yeah, it was gone. Yeah, how weird. But yeah, because the plane door was still open when I took this, and yeah. I think that's why. Okay. So, so anyway, Johnny yeah. joins us each week to help us travel better using technology. Yes. So since I'm in Canada, yeah, I thought I'd. This is a great site. It's called icebergfinder.com. <laughs> it's a great site by the tourism board of Newfoundland and Labrador, which is the easternmost province in Canada. Now, this could work both ways. You might want to avoid them, or you might want to find them. Well, this is this is to find them because I, I yeah. But once you found out, them, you could go the other way if you wanted. It turns out there's iceberg chasers. What? You know, kind of like um, leaf peepers and people who are always chasing tornadoes and things like that. And so they call this one part in Canada the Iceberg Alley. And I, I've never – sadly, I've never been to um, this province. This sounds cool. Flown, 129 I've, I've icebergs are currently floating by. So you got to click that link at the bottom. And by the way, this will only work in Google, not, uh, in uh, Chrome or Safari. It doesn't work in IE. Um, so anyway, what they do is they, you, first of all, when you're looking at is you can upload your photos if you're a traveler and on the left, if you scroll down, you'll see photos that people have taken and uploaded wow. and, and show their precise location. But what they use is, um, they use GPS data and satellite technology. Actually, yeah, they use satellite technology and tourism boards, uh, sightings. Wow, Sorry. So cool. Yeah, so and you click it and you can see the pictures on the left and some of these I mean are monsters and they say an iceberg you know what you see of it is only 10% of the size of it they say that they do yeah, and like 90% is below you know below the water I mean so you can only imagine these would be how fun big now, these some of these are. pictures many of them are taken from the shore so if you knew where the iceberg was you could go to that part of the you know the province and see it so, I mean, this is just a great example of, you know, clever marketing by clever. a tourism board. Yeah. And, you know, it has me talking about it, too. It's just it's something that makes people want to go out and check out. And I've always wanted to go there anyway, because I hear this part of the world is beautiful. And, and again, I've only flown over it. And, you know, every time I fly over Greenland, same thing. You see amazing icebergs. Yeah. Yeah, and um, it just makes me want to just touch down and check it out. I just don't want to spend too long because usually wasn't it um, look at this. off the coast of Newfoundland that uh, the Titanic hit an iceberg? <laughs> I think it yeah, was. Yeah, I, 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 I believe it was. It was. Yeah. Right. So better to so, watch it from the shore. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, ho hopefully the um, boat captains are are logging on too. That's <laughs> Ship cool. captains. Icebergfinder dot com. Yes. So and and here's my app. So it actually used to – I made it a website of the week a few years ago, but they just this week launched an iOS and Android app out of it. It's called airlinecheckins.com is the website. <clears throat> I'll actually put this in the chat room, and I'll put it on Twitter in a second. Um, <clears throat> so, again <clears> – <throat> excuse me. You know, one of the things when you check in for flights or when you when – are going to fly, you need to obviously I check think that for mist flight. in the cabin has gotten to you here. It sure has. <laughs> okay. Clogged you all up there. Yeah, I so, apologize. No, that's all right. Airlinecheckins.com. Never worry about checking in again. What? What? Yes. They check so in actually, for you? Yeah, and it was created by, it was developed by the Lufthansa Airlines Innovation Hub, their their group. And But you can do it for 200 airlines, not just Lufthansa, including Southwest is what's I really like because Southwest, you yeah. got to check in the moment. Moments, you're, yeah. You got twenty up. twenty four hours ahead of time. You got to be there right then if you want to get in the A group. You can't even get in the A group if you want to get in the B group. It's very difficult to get in the A group, but even to get in the B group. And I tried it with uh, Southwest um, six months ago, and I got the B group. And I still try to do it on my own too because I wanted to make sure. But just in case, I use it as a backup. But that's the only time I actually ever used the website. But now it's an app, and you know, I personally like to check in for my flights and I set timers on my phone. I'll send alarms five minutes before so I know I need to um, check in, depending on the airline, and especially uh, Southwest. American, which I fly often a lot, I do not do that. Um, so but, we're going to Vegas next week to see Jennifer nice. Lopez. 
And I'm going to oh, use really? this. I'm going to try uh, this. On Southwest? Uh, that's a good, yeah, I bet it is, but I don't remember. I'm going to have to check. What, what airport you're flying out of? Um, no, I think we had to go out of SFO, so it's probably not then, Southwest. Yeah, huh? it's probably Alaska or United. I think it's Alaska, yeah. I don't know, but Alaska. And if you, yeah, I like that. And if you fly Alaska, by the way, I have a column in there, uh, in Flight Magazine. You do? Yeah, I've been for a couple nice. of years. Yeah, you know, but, Alaska bought Virgin uh, America, which is, yeah, I'm on Alaska Airlines. So, so there's no advantage to checking it ahead of time if you have a reserved seat, right? No, I, no, but definitely not. I, I would just mostly use it for airlines where Southwest you really is the need one you want. to. Yeah, Southwest. You don't get it. You have to get in line to get a seat. Yeah. But also like British Airways, they charge you to check in for your flight. They charge you for your seat, um, you know, 24 hours or out. But within the 24 hours, uh, it's free. So I like to oh. you know, set my alarm for them too, even for business class. Wait a minute. You and can't pick a seat on BA – for business class without paying for it even on business class wow paying extra so i would set it for that nice so yeah um, nice and, and and it will take and what's good about this app is that it will it will um take in consideration your seat preferences so i like you know i like exit row aisle or um if i'm flying in business class i like a window seat so it's now like now it was a website airline checkins.com but now uh you can Get the an app, app and have yep, it on your phone, free. which I think makes it even more convenient. For sure. And one of my readers actually sent me an email last week saying that, you know, after I rec recommended it, they've he's used it for seven flights. And all of them but one worked great. And it was Norwegian Air that did not. And it was not um, the the app's fault or the um, website's fault. Airline check-ins. Uh, downloading it. It's on the App Store. Awesome. I mean, it's a real basic app. Yeah, because you're just going to – do you have to manually enter in the flight information and all that? You have to, yeah, you have to put all your information okay. in, yeah. All right. See, TripIt should uh, just uh, acquire these guys and put it in their TripIt because TripIt well, already knows it, when I'm going and when, where. That's true. Yeah. That's true. The one thing I don't like about – I love TripIt, first of all. The one thing I don't like about TripIt is that I, I change my flights often, and you – it doesn't update it automatically. No, it's a pain. You have yeah. to forward yeah. your new reservation. And then you have to delete the old one and all that. And then it says there's a conflict. And that, that's JohnnyJet.com. Like that's his website. He's on the Instagram at JohnnyJet on Twitter too. Johnny Jet. And he joins us each week. Johnny, safe travels. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo the phone number. On we go, Mike in Maine. Mike says he can ask a pilot. He is on the frequently on the Ask a Pilot podcast, right, Mike? Well, it's the I'm uh, frequently on the Airplane Geeks. Airplane podcast. Geeks. Sorry about that. I'm a contributor at large, but I'm also a regular contributor to the Airline Pilot Guy podcast. That's the one I was thinking of. So, right. do you? That's so, that's what, what we're talking about is Johnny Jet's tweet. From today, he was on a flight that was uh, – uh, the door was open on the plane. So the warm air from the outside in Miami was still in the plane. They turned on the uh, AC and the blower, and it just started misting. And that happens a lot, and there's a lot of questions that come in to Captain Jeff, who is the airline pilot guy, about that. And people are really fearful of it sometimes because they see smoke coming from the, uh, you know, from the air conditioning vents. But it's not smoke. It's just condensation. It's just the cold air meeting the warm air. And sometimes you even see that in your car if you've got a really good air conditioner. Going. Yeah, I have seen it in my car. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And it's just the same thing. But in an airplane, sometimes it can get really, really hot in there because think about it. It's just an aluminum tube. Right. You know, and there's right. no ventilation. There's right. no nothing. There's just those doors. So sometimes it can get really hot and you'll really see it condense and it'll look like smoke blowing, but it's not. And it can get to the point sometimes where it might even drip a little bit, and it's just condensation <laughs> falling from it. it that air coming out of those vents is awfully cold, and in Miami, with the door open and all that humidity, uh, it's pretty warm, and that makes sense. It's just right. cold air meets warm air, and you get rain. That's all it is. And when it's on the ground, they're usually running the air conditioning. They have it hooked up to an air conditioning uh, machine on the ground with a big duct in there. And it's just incredibly cold to right. keep, it, you know, keep the airplane cool. So it doesn't have anything to do with a malfunction in the airplane's air conditioner. It's not that that not somehow... No. Not at all. And, and I wanted to call and get in because there are so many people that are really frightened of flying and get frightened. I know, Micah. And we shouldn't let anybody get afraid of flying because it's the safest way to travel. 
absolutely the safest. There's yeah. no doubt about it. Yeah. And by the way, for listeners who, and if I can mention this, can I give a little Please, plug? you you I, earned your plug, my friend. For listeners who may be in the Washington, D.C. area, the, at this uh, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum Udvar-Hazy Center in Chantilly next Saturday is Innovations in Flight Family Day, <gasps> an outdoor aviation display. And it's for engineering and STEM and all that research. It's a wonderful family day, and the airplane geeks go every year, and we'll be recording a podcast live from there. And this year, the airline pilot guy people are coming down, and we should be there as well. So it's a great way to meet up and, and, and meet some of the people if you listen to those podcasts. When they opened that udvar Hazi Center, I went out there to see it. This must be almost 15 years ago. It is fantastic, and it's big enough that you can get all these planes inside. Which is the Enola Gay is there? The B twenty nine that dropped the bomb on Hirosh Hiroshima. Yep. A Concorde is in there. Inside the aircraft. Inside, inside touching wing to wing. There's a there's a B there's a stealth Blackbird stealth bomber in there. It's SR seventy one. It's amazing. The original uh, 707, the Dash 8, the original Love aircraft it. that Tex Johnson actually rolled when he was test flying. Wow. It's sitting right there. Across it is. The it's an amazing museum. It's the part of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. There are national treasures, all of the Smithsonian's. And that new center, well, I call it new. The relatively new center is well worth a trip. It's really great. The only problem is it's not in town proper. You have to go out of town to see it, but it's incredible. But it's right next to IAD Airport, Dulles Airport. Right. You can fly right in and take the shuttle. Yep. Great idea. Well, that's going to be... When's the event? It's a week from today. Nice. Well, have a great time. The airline pilot guy. Thank you so much. Yeah. And if you're if you're in, if you're at Dulles, uh, it's IAD is Dulles, right? Yes, it is. If you're at Dulles or you can get to Dulles quickly and easily next Saturday, that sounds like a wonderful thing to do for everybody. Udvar Hazy Center in Chantilly. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank a you, Mike. Day. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the info, too. There was a fierce battle raging in the chat room over what was going on in that plane. You know, it doesn't smell like smoke. You know, it's obviously condensation, so there's no need for fear. It's just a question of, of why. That's what they were debating, I think. Cookie, Valencia, California. Hi, Cookie. Oh, hi. Finally. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Sorry to keep you on hold so long. Thanks for your patience. Oh, uh, that's all right. So um, I want to get a 3D printer for my grandkids. And I'm having a really tough time. I'm looking everywhere, Amazon. I went to one of the websites that you recommend, but they pretty much just have their own um printers and i need help <laughs> the the only issue is budget because i i can recommend you know probably the easiest 3d printer but it is not the least expensive so what were you what were you will w interested I, I was thinking maybe around 300 dollars or less yeah so um at 300 bucks you're you're gonna go with the budget model because uh they can they can go up into thousands obviously but um, generally, I like the printer bot. But let me, but I think the printer bot is uh, about six hundred bucks, so it's a little bit out of your price range. So mm -hmm. I would look at, uh, I guess, in that price range, the Da Vinci Nano. It's two hundred twenty-nine dollars. Yeah, from X Y Z. Can you um, can you print like? sizable things or are they just like mini? none of them let you print anything too big <laughs> you know you could bring print uh things kind of roughly the size of a lego brick maybe maybe a little bigger than that obviously but uh, but not much bigger you're not going to print a car uh no, the, the issue really on these especially for uh kids who are have not done this before is that some printers take a little are more finicky than others and so, uh, you know, ideally, if you're getting a, pr a 3D printer for a kid, you'd get one that was forgiving, but not in that. Pr but that's we're gonna. That's gonna be hundreds, probably 600 bucks. So mm -hmm. I would say, um, you know, if you if you're willing to spend 600, take a look at the printer bot, P R I N T R B O T, the play. They start at 500, 500 to 600 bucks. But uh, given your price point, you're gonna. And you know what? They're kids. They can. They can. They have to calibrate it. They can learn how to do all of that. Well, they're really young kids. Their dad's going to help 
<laughs> yeah, well, da- so you got to talk to dad and say, "Dad, <laughs> how do you how do you feel about this purchase?" Because it is it's going to take some attention. So take a look mm-hmm. at the Da Vinci Nano. It's actually as low as one hundred seventy nine bucks. It's fairly inexpensive. You know about the, um, somebody said something about the TiVo Tornado. Don't know that. Um, Let me look at that one. Uh, there's a lot of them. This has become a crowded category. TiVo Tornado, most assembled full aluminum frame. Well, that looks pretty nice. I haven't played with that. Four hundred bucks. Um, actually, I've seen it for three forty. Yeah. Um, you know, I should ask my uh, my expert. Uh, we have a we have a guy who spends a lot of time uh, playing with these three D printers, and he had a recommendation uh, for something that was fairly easy to use. I would also look at the Wirecutter dot com. They have a review of three D printers. Let me just see what they like. The best choice for most people starting up, they say, is the Tier Time Up Mini Two. Tier Time Up Mini 2, unfortunately, $600. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a, a less expensive printer called the uh, Monoprice Maker Select. That's $300. Um, it puts out consistently great, great prints and can print the largest objects of any printer we've tested. That's from Monoprice, mm-hmm. the Maker Select. And that is one of their recommendations. It's a budget. It's their budget pick. So that might oh, be one, okay. to, one to look at. Uh, Wirecutter is very reliable. Oh, okay. Because I did go on Monoprice. Yeah. Uh, It's it's, the fact that it it sounded like you wanted to to be able to print large things. Well, not large, but, you know, bigger than a Lego. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Nothing's going to be large. Otherwise, what's the point? Right. Well, really, I mean, the the point is more, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of, the whole process is the point, like making a 3D design. This is why dad is definitely going to get involved. You go to the website, mm-hmm. and you download a design you like, you play with it, you put it in the printer. And to see it kind of emerge is very cool. Um, you know, so, yeah, th- uh, this uh, Maker Select sounds like it's a, actually a pretty good choice for mono price. Okay. For, especially for that, that price, yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. My pleasure. By That's a way. great gift. Thank you. By the way, did you know that when you're on hold, everybody that's on hold can hear your conversations? I did know that. Oh, okay. <laughs> but thanks for the warning. <laughs> yeah, we stream uh, a live audio and video of the behind the scenes. So it's not just the people on hold. There's a few thousand people also <laughs> privy to everything that goes on. <laughs> Part of the fun. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls right after this. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones and smart watches and 3D printing and all that jazz, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, 888-827-5536, toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. You know, I don't want to discourage anybody from buying 3D printers, but uh, <laughs> they're not, uh, They see, it seems like a cool idea, it is a cool idea, it's just a, so difficult to use, it requires so much attention and kind of babying and then when you when you're done, you get a, a little piece of plastic that's kind of cool, but not really. I'm not sure. I I would not sh- recommend in general 3D printers. Unless you, I don't know if you really knew you had a good reason for it. There, you know, there was it was a revolution. Everybody was talking about this. It's like the personal computer revolution a few years ago. Oh, 3D printers, soon they'll be everywhere. You'll have a garage size 3D printer that can print a car. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah, like many things in technology, the promise, the fantasy far outstrips the reality. You, you almost be better off before you bought a 3D printer to go to a makerspace. There's maker spaces in many communities where they have these things uh, and try one out 
There'll be an expert. There'll be a local expert there who's the 3D printer guy, and he can maybe show you some tips and tricks. And uh, yeah, I would try it out before. <laughs> I've never, I've never really had much success. Maybe it's me. Maybe it could be me. I've never had much success with 3D printers, and they they find them to be really more uh, exercises in frustration. And I don't think I'm alone. I mean, I think that this was at one time a very hot category and now mm, not so much there's of course there's commercial 3d printers that do amazing things and there's metal printers there's all kinds of interesting takes on this but these are not for uh, hobbyists the hobbyist category yeah i'm not i'm not sure i'm not sure that's that's going anywhere wade in minneapolis minnesota leo laporte the tech guy hey leo um I've heard you talk about, uh, like, NAS, Synology, and QNAP, maybe. And yeah. Is there one that would work with a Chromebook for, like, backing up photos? I do use Google Photos um, from the phone and then uh, and then from the Chromebook as my primary well, That's computer. an interesting. I never really even thought of that question. Usually, you know, the reason people like Chromebooks and I recommend Chromebooks is you don't back them up. You basically, everything's stored in the cloud anyway. Yeah. Right? That's why they come with so little storage. But then we have to, I've talked to people who said, oh, I lost all the stuff on my Chromebook that she was using it to save stuff. And, uh, you know, it's not really the design. The Chromebook design, you're supposed to use Google Drive as your storage, which case it's already backed up. Yeah. Um, so let me think. If you're going to use a network attached, well, uh, <laughs> you certainly can. I mean, I can access my network attached storage device from anywhere, including any browser, including Chrome. Uh, on download files from it. The, but you're asking about getting files up to it. Yeah, I mean, like, would it create your own, like, little private cloud kind of thing? and it, Or would it just not oh, work Oh, I see. Way? Using it instead of Google Drive, maybe as, as a private... Yeah, as, like, a secondary backup, kind of like a private cloud, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's the... I don't even know if that would work or if it's kind of overkill or... <laughs> so you can... Uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, you can, on Chromebooks, mount NAS drives. So they can show up as a file share. You know, one of the ways that these work, a NAS for people listening, and we're using this acronym as a network-attached storage device. It's really a very big hard drive. It's actually a computer minus a monitor, keyboard, and mouse. It's connected onto your network, and what it really has is massive storage. And the idea is you'd use it to store video files or store backup to it. There are a lot of good uses for network-attached storage. And apparently you can mount drives. Uh, you can also use a secure FTP to send files to the drives. But I'm not sure if you really would want to use it for backup. And I, I'm pretty sure that there are... Uh, there's probably no... Synology, anyway, doesn't have any software on it for specifically for Chrome OS, which it would need to if you were going to do a backup. There are a couple of Chrome extensions you can get. Uh, what, probably the one you'd want is Network File Share for Chrome OS that lets you mount the drive so you could see it. And you could drag files to it. People don't do this because Google, you know, Chrome OS was set up by Google to use Google Drive. And, you know, that's kind of how they want you to use it. That's why it exists um for from their point of view but yeah i guess you can do it uh, i've just heard of like people like backing it. it's kind of like a secondary you were talking the other day yeah it's like, nice to have yeah. two right yeah yeah i mean you can trust you absolutely could trust the fact that google's backing up the backup of your yeah. drive so it's not like so yeah here's a so okay i take it back synology does have a an extension i on um the chrome extension is called synology's download station but it looks like I don't think it'll have the automated backup. It's uh, yeah, no, it's just downloading stuff. So that's good. that's the trick. What you want is a, is a program that will either run on the Chromebook or run on the Synology that will periodically look at the drive in the Chromebook and mount and and uh, and copy it all over to the Synology. I don't yeah. know if such a thing exists, really. That's a very interesting question. I think mostly it doesn't exist because there's no demand for it. Because again. They'll all automatically back up, as will your Google Photos, to Google. Yeah, and that's kind of your primary... Yeah, you know. there's no need to back up Google because they back it up. I yeah. suppose if Google went out of business, 
or there was some sort of massive collapse of, the, of Google. But I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm not really concerned about it, but I just yeah. No, that's a great. It's a, I, it's a great question. I don't. Um, there are you know so Synology does have photo apps, uh, and uh, you know that are designed for storing and, and sharing photos, and uh, you can have your phone automatically upload the photos to the Synology. So if the primary source for your photos in Google Photos is your camera, your camera phone, then that would do it anyway. You could back that up to the Synology Photos app. From from the phone itself. Yeah. Does, does oh, 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 and I just thought of another thing. I just realized you can't back up from the Chromebook, but Synology does have a Google Cloud Drive backup. I okay. actually use that. So it backs up whatever's on your Google Cloud to the Synology. So actually, that's what you would do. Don't back it up from the Chromebook. See, I was fixated on backing it up from the Chromebook. You don't need to. Have the Chromebook back up to, to Google Drive, and then you can offload Google Drive. You can store it on your, on your NAS. And actually, that's a smart way to do it. That way, if Google did go out of business, you'd, you'd, have, a, you'd have a backup. I have been doing that. Is there... Um, notice that... Does it, it works over the. You have to be connected. Well, I mean, over the internet or, or over the. Well, network. yeah, and generally, you you do want to connect your Synology over the internet. Yeah. No, I mean, it doesn't have to be. Well, I guess you'd be using the phone. It would just do it automatically. I mean, it it would just do it. If automatically. it's from the phone, uh, it's automatic. Whenever, uh, yeah, because the the most network attached storages are not devices are not only attached to your local network, they're also attached to the cloud. That poses some security issues, but it's most useful if you can access it remotely. And it can get stuff, download stuff from other systems, from your phone, for instance. So, generally, I mean, that's how I have it. You have to, you want to lock it down. But this, I think Synology is very good about keeping it secure and locking it down. Don't turn on services you don't need. Don't turn on web browsers you don't need. Things like that, or web servers, I should say. No, is uh, photos are part of Google Drive, so that would be automatic. Yep. Okay. Yep. okay. yep. So that's what you should do. That's what I do. And that, that that way you have a whole copy of everything that's on Google Drive. If you should, you know, here's the real. The only really reasonable nightmare scenario, for some reason, Google kills your account. And that does happen from time. You violated our terms of service and they kill your account. Um, so that's why it's a good idea to back up your Google Drive. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Website techguylabs.com. More of your calls right after this. Sorry, I had to take that break, but I'm still here. Go ahead. Cool. Yeah, is there a, kind of switching gears, like a, a decent smartwatch that has like a fairly secure payment? Um, I kind of stopped using Fitbit, but I was thinking like Garmin, like um, Garmin Pay or something. Is that like just if you're all... Well, all, all Android Wear uh, watches do have Android Pay, uh, I think. And uh, certainly all the Apple watches have Apple Pay. And that really, those are really good solutions because they are secure. They're much more secure than a credit card. Um, I don't know about Garmin. I don't think so unless they, I think, it, um, but any Android Wear watch with NFC, which I'm sure is all Android Wear watches will do it. Do you need the phone on you then or can you just wear the watch? Like if you're out for a walk oh, or that's something. That's a good question. With iPhone, you don't. Um... Garmin has something called Garmin Pay. Oh, they do have Garmin Pay. Yeah, but uh, so I was just curious, but I I didn't know if that worked. It sounds like maybe you don't need the the phone near you. But Contactless. Kind of oh, look at them! Look at them, Garmin. Good for you. The Garmin devices. All right, and pay for your purchases. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's touchless. I presume it's EMV. Um. They're probably doing it through a third party. Yeah, you know, the Vivo Active and the Forerunner. Yeah, if you're a runner, the Garmin's are great. Are you a runner? Well, more like walk. I just don't like to carry stuff with me. Like, <clears throat> yeah, like Garmin Pay works with Visa and Mastercard and it, contactless terminals. Yeah, oh, I had not heard of that. Yeah, it looks like it works with the like the way like the cards with. I mean, it's contactless. It. it not yeah. the chip ones, but yeah. the, the wave or whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if Android Wear, if you have to, uh, if you can do it without the phone 
around or not. Samsung also, of course, is Samsung Pay on its watches, and I really like the Samsung watches. Um, yeah, I met a kid. He had one of those, and he said he really likes it. Oh, I love it. Um, I have a a Nexus phone though, so like the I use the project. It'll work with a Nexus. No, it'll work with a Nexus. Okay. Yeah. So the Samsung Gear S3 uh, works fine with any Android phone. Uh, yeah, that's what he had, I think. I didn't know if it... Yeah. yeah, and you put Samsung Pay on the phone. Okay. Yeah. You probably need the phone then with that, though, or maybe not. <sighs> I don't think so. I think once the watch is activated, you can continue to go around and pay stuff without okay. the... And I'm pretty sure Android Wear works that way as well. Okay. So, yeah, you have you have four choices. I was thank you for telling me about Garmin Pay though. I wasn't aware of that one. Yeah, just I don't know. I just kind of found it. A buddy, uh, my buddy's kid was using just like a regular yeah, Garmin, yeah, that's cool. as an alternative. That's really to cool. Fit. Yeah, yeah. All right, got to run. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo the phone number line for Bill in Vista, California. Hi, Bill. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm pretty good. Good. I had a couple of questions for you. Yes. Um, have you been following the Computex uh, show that's been going on in Taipei this week? I have some very interesting new PCs and all sorts of information. Yeah. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. First, of, well, more asking you your opinion. First of all, what did you think of Intel when they brought out their 28 core, <laughs> but they conveniently, quote, unquote, forgot to tell people that it was overclocked? Yeah. Yeah. That it was nitrogen chill. Yeah. Yeah, they were all excited because they had a 5 gigahertz chip. Except it doesn't run at 5 gigahertz without being nitrogen cooled. Well, yeah, you, I yeah. mean... You can get most unlocked Intel chips nowadays up to that if you can cool them with yeah. liquid nitrogen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a little disingenuous of them, wasn't it? I, I f yeah. This is their new, this is the uh, 50th anniversary chip, the 8086K. Right. A K, when you see K on an Intel chip, that means it's unlocked. That means you right. can overclock it. So and they're having a drawing, actually, where you can... Yeah, you can, away. they're giving away 8,086 yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I entered it. Good. Uh, second question was... What it, I hope you have PC? nitrogen cooling in your system. <laughs> they say they say the yeah. base clock is 4 gigahertz. You know, it, the real truth is it's been very hard for Intel or anybody else to get a chip faster than 4 gigahertz efficiently yeah. and effectively. Yeah. And yeah. This doesn't surprise me. Go ahead. Yeah. Second question. Um, what did you think of AMD when they came out with their... Not only they surpassed the 28 core, they went to 32... And then they went from their uh, 14 nanometer die to 7 nanometer. Yeah, I'm really uh, rooting for AMD. And I think with their latest uh, stuff with the Threadripper and uh, their new Wrath Ripper air cooler for the Threadripper. And I love the naming. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the problem with a that AMD is facing, I think, is that they just... Now, they're this may be, and I'll have to look at the, the benchmarks of these. They may finally be catching up. For some reason, they've been, uh, it's been a little hard for them to make chips that are as good as the Intel chips. And, you know, for a long time, uh, I loved AMD and I was grateful to AMD because without AMD, Intel would be even worse than it is. But in the last couple of years, Intel right. really has gone downhill. They have not been able to innovate. And it's given AMD time to kind of catch up. Uh, right. So these new AMD uh, processors are, I think, at least on paper, uh, fairly impressive. The, 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 they have a 32-core Threadripper. Um, but remember, one of the things to keep in mind, you're obviously an enthusiast, the number of cores isn't necessarily mean it's, it's a much faster processor. The cores benefit you if you do something that will use more than one core. But most of what you do right. only uses one core at a time. Right, and that's my final and last question. I'm going to be putting together a uh, quote-unquote workstation. I do, I'm not really interested in gaming, uh, more as far as like uh, rendering and 3D modeling and so forth. So that's where you'd be benefiting uh, right. multi-cores. Yeah. You know, I bought, I bought the 10-core uh, iMac Pro, and it doesn't uh -huh. feel any, in any way faster. But I can keep a lot of processes running at once. And when I'm doing things like 3D rendering, 
that do take right. a lot of time, it is faster. Right. Although, you know, I, I recently 3D rendered a GoPro video. It still took many hours, just fewer hours than it did on a single core, a quad core, or a dual core yeah. processor. So I, I it's, it's a specialty product for people who know that they're going to be doing stuff that will take advantage of those multiple cores. I guess the conundrum I'm having is whether I should go with like an i7 8700K versus a, uh, a, a thread ripper paired with like a quadro card, like a P2000 right. or an M4000. You know, what was your it's, you know, you're going to, we're going to, I mean, AMD didn't even say what the clock speeds are on these new thread rippers. So it doesn't, it's premature at this point to say whether right. the thread ripper oh. is is going to be a competitor or not. For what or they no. have out now. For what they have out now. What they have, the Ryzen's are pretty nice. Um, my general, I would I would actually, I can't give, my general impression is they're not quite what the Intel processors are. You you really might look at a Xeon as opposed to an i7 if yeah. multi-core processing is key to you, which it sounds like it is. You're going to, you want a lot of L2 cache, of course, you're going to want a lot right. of RAM as well because you'll be storing big models in memory. Um, and right. then, and then, you know, the Xeons are designed; they're des they're so-called workstation chips, and that's what makes a workstation yeah. a workstation is doing all this rendering. Yeah, I was looking on like eBay on like some of their uh, used like their workstations. You know, like companies they recycle stuff. That's where I would go to like, be honest like with you. Quad processors. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah. I don't think Intel's really made huge jumps in performance in some time. So right. uh, a year-old Xeon is not necessarily out of date, even though there are newer no. chips out there. And you're right, talking right. desktop, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't yeah. care about power, you know, how much no. how much watt, no. watt it should use. Yeah. You don't care about heat yeah. as Unlimited. much. Unlimited, coming out of that. Yeah, <laughs> might as well. Use 150 <laughs> watts. Go for it. That's, by the way, these thread rippers. if you take a look at the, a 32-core processor, we're gonna, I mean, that thing is going to use a lot of juice. That's, yeah, they're like talking two, or two to 400 watts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. That's why, you got, that's why you start using nitrogen cooling. <laughs> that's why because, it's solar on the roof. <laughs> yeah, watts in means heat out, usually. So, right, exactly. Yeah, and, okay. and yeah, I, this, is a, this is a tough, this is a high-end enthusiast question, and I would definitely look at the enthusiast websites like Anon's Tech. Um, we have a podcast on, the, on our podcast network, Twit, called This Week in Computer Hardware, where Ryan Shroud of PC Perspective uh, talks about this stuff with uh, my old buddy Patrick Norton. Um, I, PC Perspective, PCPer.com is also a great site. Look at these sites. They tend to be a little bit focused on benchmarks more than real-world performance, uh -huh. but they will give you at least an apple-to-apple -apple comparison between the Intel and the uh, and the AMD chips and probably can give you a pretty good recommendation. You're, you're the kind of hardcore user uh, that really is going to want to do that research before you spend what probably will be eight to $10,000 on a PC. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hey, have fun. Right. Good luck. All right. Thanks. All right. All right thanks. I'm, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask. You know, I have, I have, I'm looking at a Xeon machine I built just a, a year ago. And I, like I said, I bought the iMac 10 core. And all I do with it is, um, <laughs> I don't know, surf the web. It's not, not great. Oh, shoot. I've run out of time. Darn it. Uh, I'll tell you what. Nathan, I will get your commercial in the next break. We're going to take a break now, though, for the bottom of the hour. And more of your calls, too. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. See, get me talking about speeds and feeds, and I can't shut up. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Back to the phones uh, we go. And on the line from Los Angeles, Henry. Hi, Henry. Hi, Leo. Uh, I have a Mac in my kitchen that I have hooked up to a stereo setup that I've got in the kit in the um, ceiling of the speakers, and then nice. living room next door have a um, Apple TV connected to the um, home entertainment stereo, and so I play those together and and sync and with through iTunes, and it works it works well. Um, and, but I want to add an uh, Apple Airport in my bedroom, and I, you know, with the, the can do that can connect and extend the music in the same way that I've got um, going through the other two. But Apple's just continued the, the Apple Airport. So, 
you know, what's a, is there something else that can talk to uh, Apple, you know, iTunes and be a, an extended speaker in the way that the Airport Express can? Yeah, so you were using the Airport Express, and the way, it was kind of cool. Uh, they, they stopped updating these about five years ago, but you plugged it into the wall. It was a Wi-Fi device, but it also had a jack for audio, and you were able to send audio around that way. Uh, yeah, Apple stopped making those. They stopped updating them five years ago. They finally admitted, yeah, we're not going to sell those anymore. No more airport extremes, no more airport expresses. So the issue, but but the good news is all of that is pretty old-fashioned anyway. Uh, it works. Uh, it may even work more reliably than current solutions. So you want to play music from your okay. computer in the kitchen yeah. and you want to be able to get it to the bedroom and you don't mind that you can't control it in the kitchen i mean in the bedroom well yeah no that's fine i mean i would get it set up and it's just uh, yeah that's fine that's not a problem okay because most of the time nowadays what people do is they use uh multi-rooms audio systems from other companies apple actually is starting to rebuild this idea with the home pod but it's very early days yet they have updated their version of airplay airplay 2 which does have multi-room sound so you could there's a couple of ways to go if you want something today sonos is the right answer uh, and what sonos will do is it'll take music from your computer your uh, apple computer but also because most most of the days, most of the time these days, people use things like Spotify or Apple Music. They use streaming systems. So Sonos will also play those. It'll play music from a variety, hundreds of different sources, including so, iTunes library. Yes. So what okay. you do is you'd uh, instead of buying an Airport Extreme in your bedroom, you'd buy uh, if you have speakers already, you can buy uh, Sonos Connect, which just connects speakers up to much like the Airport Extreme. It's very similar in function. Or you could buy Sonos's own speakers, which have that functionality built in. The advantage of doing it that way is you can run Sonos on your computer in the kitchen. It'll pick up all the stuff in your iTunes library and allow you to play it. But you don't have to control it from the kitchen. You can control it on your phone. And, uh, in fact, Sonos even makes devices you control by voice. You can use Amazon's Echo technology, uh, soon Google Home technology, to control it via voice as well. So you could be lying in the bedroom and say, Echo, uh, let's listen to my collection of uh, Beatles bootlegs. Uh, not available on any streaming service, but yes, on your computer, and it will pick it up from your computer and play it back in your bedroom. No, that sounds perfect. The, the only question is, um, you know, the one thing that the, the Apple solution does is it keeps the, I, when I'm playing it from iTunes on the computer in the kitchen and then sync to other rooms, it stays in sync. It's on, it, you know, there's that the delay. There's That's delay why you want there. Sonos. That's exactly right. So the, the trick with any of these multi-room systems is if you have any lag between these systems, uh, you're going to get echo. It's going to sound very weird. And Sonos actually pioneered this. They use some sort of time code technology to make sure everything's in sync. So as you walk around, it just sounds like the whole, if you want to use all of them at once, it sounds like everything's in sync. It sounds like you just have a massive single speaker system in every room. There's also Chromecast does this as well. The Chromecast audio uh, can also do this. So uh, that's a third way to do it use, using Google's solution. But I don't know if they'll pick up your music library. You might have to upload it to Google for that to work. Uh, so I would I would suggest using the Sonos, which does, in fact, see the Apple music library. That's great. Yep. Thank you, Bill. My pleasure. Yeah. So Sonos just announced a new uh, speaker system for the TV. It's about the size of a baguette, <laughs> 24 inches. Uh, and it sits in front of the TV. It's a new sound bar from Sonos. And it has built-in... Um, Amazon Echo. So they're going to, clearly, they're going to uh, be doing this um, in all their speakers as they as they update them. The new soundbar will have AirPlay 2 support as well. So that's, it's called the Sonos Beam. I'll get one as soon as I can. I think it comes out later this, uh, this month. Not quite the Play Bar. It's not quite as big or as powerful as the Play Bar. But so Sonos is great because you control it with an app on your phone. You can stream music from a variety of services, and yes, it will also see your local music library through iTunes. Um, so that's it's it's a pretty flexible solution. I think one of the reasons Apple doesn't bother with the airport anymore is they've been they've been replaced essentially by by better choices.
from a variety of companies. Uh, route, better routers, far better routers. Uh, and, you know, these music systems. I, I had a bunch of airport uh, expresses just for that purpose, actually. Come to think of it. Let's see if we get another call in before a Dick D. Bartolo, the Gizwiz, comes up with a crazy gadget. Bonnie on the line from Costa Mesa, California. Hi, Bonnie. I called in before, and, and you, you went off the air before I got in. Oh, nuts. Yeah. Well, you almost, almost did it again. Well, what can I do for you? Okay, well, I have two questions. I have, uh, I had a uh, XP computer and went kicking and screaming a year or so ago and bought a new Win 10. And uh, my external hard drive is a uh, Western Dig external hard drive. Um, works fine on my older computer. I still have it. But when I put it, when I plug it into my new one, um, the only thing that appears on there is uh, you know my my data is not on there. I I'm on my computer right now, and I can tell you what shows up when I click on my passport. Um, so, is it a question of installing it, or I, I don't know what to do to no, make? No, if you've so you're pretty sure you backed it all up onto that external drive. Yeah, because I put it back onto my old computer, and everything's on there. But you don't see it now. But I don't see it on my new computer. I did you, see, I did see you, the, the, okay. the drive. I have to take a break. Hang on. I'm going to talk to you off the air. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, Mad Magazine's maddest writer, and the Gizwiz coming up next. So, um, so okay, so you, you have this external drive. You put all your data onto it before. In fact, that's how you got it on your old computer, right? Well, no, I, I bought it brand new when I had my old computer, and then I just, you know, would back up onto it. Okay, so you were backing up to this passport. Yeah, and so when I plug the uh, passport into my new computer, you know, there's there's no data there. It's were you backing it up with a program, or were you just copying it over? Oh, jeez, I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> So if you back it up with, say, a Windows, the Windows Backup Program or some other program, you'll need to use that to restore it. Did you get rid of the old computer, or do you still have it? Oh, I still have it. And when I plug my, my external hard drive into the old computer, it's everything's there. Oh, when you plug it in, you can see it on the passport. Yeah. All my, my backup data is on there, all my files and everything. But when I plug the uh, uh, hard drive into my new computer you see nothing and uh, no all i see is if i click on it to open it i see auto run documentation meonet my my wd backup temp temp install j start launcher setup. so my guess is that when you first got that passport on the f old computer you ran some of that software on the passport to make it s visible to install it yeah uh, yeah i probably did so I think you need to do that now on the new computer before you'll be able to see anything. And probably what that is 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 uh, some sort of copy, some sort of encryption so that people can't right. steal your stuff. Right. So what you have to figure out, yeah, it's going to be in there in the auto run probably. So uh, there's, oh, in auto run? Yeah, there's a, if there's an auto run dot inf. No, it just says auto run. Okay, if you open that in Word. File folder icon. But then there's another thing that has a different icon that says install. Should I just click yeah, on that? Yeah, try installing, yeah. Okay, okay. I'll try that. Now, my other question was, on my older computers, I used WordPerfect. And I only have uh, a few documents that I, you know, write to or, or update or whatever. I don't want to buy another word processing thing and have to get used to, you know, go through the whole thing, how to use it. I'm 76 this month, and so I just I don't have patience for that. Um, I was able to switch my word perfect from one of my older computers to the old, the, the one, the newest older one that I have now. But I can't get it to go on my new Win 10 computer. So... Um, if you have any suggestions for that, fine. If not, I'm trying to figure out how to use WordPad or Notepad. Yeah, WordPad is is actually pretty good. What you want to do, Corel offers a WordPerfect 
file format converter. So what you... Let me write that down. Yeah, so Corel, who makes Word Perfect these days, C-O-R-E-L.com. If you, if you search uh, over on Corel.com for a Word Perfect converter... It, it's a program that will take the WPD files and convert them into plain text or Microsoft Word uh, doc format, which WordPad can read. And uh, if you do that, you'll probably preserve the formatting in WordPad. Okay. So they call it WP Convert Utility, I think. But, that's, but yeah, you'll need to get that from Corel, and it will convert those files into a format that Microsoft's WordPad's fine. And there's also Microsoft Word Online. There's a web-based version of it. Both of those are free and probably all you'll need unless you have, you know, some highly sophisticated uh, special uses. I got to run. Nice to talk to you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He's the disco guy, Dick D. Bartolo. I saw a video of you that you posted, I guess, on uh, your Facebook page of you in, what is it, 1982? Yes. On your oh my disco gosh. boat with Bill Gaines, <laughs> former uh, editor and Mad Mag, founder of Mad Magazine, off dancing on your disco boat. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Wow. Exactly. You looked very different, Dick, <clears throat> but you did you did have the disco garb on. So I did. That I was did. awesome. That was fun. Uh, and a lot of hair. Yes. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to some wig company. <laughs> hey, Dick D. Bartolo joins us each uh, week. He takes a little time off from his writing for Mad Magazine to share a gizmo or a gadget with us. He collects them, you know. That's why we call him the Gizwiz. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not collecting this, but I thought this was quite interesting for companies that want to start producing videos or companies that want to do a podcast and don't know where to start. So I, there was a, a, an event last month called uh, Tech Day at the Pier, and it was a huge uh, expo, mainly of new companies or companies with new ideas. And that's where I met this guy named Josh Apta, who said, Dick, when a company doesn't know what to do, he said, I, I put together what I call the ultimate studio for podcasting. Oh. And his, his company is called Padcaster. Uh, okay. All right. And so, and so, what he includes is you provide the iPad, and when and if you buy one of these kits, you tell them which iPad, and, and they set it up that way. But you can use any iPad and change it at any time. So you get the wide angle lens, you get an LED adjustable Does light. Does it come panel. with a camera? It come. It comes with no. You use your iPad. Oh, the iPad camera. Okay. okay. Camera. Okay. But it comes with uh, a mini teleprompter. Wow. It comes with three different a uh, hand mic, uh, a mic that's mounted onto the uh, iPod. It comes with the lighting system. It comes with the tripod. It comes with a green screen. A uh, green screen a, too. Wow! <laughs> a huge green screen. It all packs down into a. I think he said it was a twelve and a half or a thirteen pound backpack. I see the backpack. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, I mean, if you know everything about this, you can do this for a lot cheaper than that. But he said a company, all they want to do is make out one purchase order and know that everything is there. And I am the tech support guy. So when you're setting it up, if any of the people there have trouble, I walk them through it. So I wish it's it weren't so expensive because I, I, know, I would love expensive. to get this. Yeah, It is expensive. It's, it's almost $1,300. But again, he said... They started selling pieces and then people go, can I use this with that? And, and he thought, you know what? They even make the tripod. The, everything comes through them so that if you have to call Josh, he knows exactly what you're talking about because he supplied everything. I think this is really interesting. It, it, it's, a, it's a very clever idea. And, and they introduced at the, uh, the peer event. Uh, a mini version for four hundred dollars, uh, more for uh, a desktop kind of use. That has a mini tripod, and the mini tripod has a built-in. I think it was thirty-two hundred milliamp battery. So it's just again, if you know how to buy this stuff, you can buy it a lot cheaper. But if you're in the quandary as to how to set it up, you could just go on this website and check it out. The Padcaster, Padcaster.com. Padcast.com. And, 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 and at the beginning, he said, Dick, when this is over, I'm giving you one. And then when it was over, 
I didn't get one. So I figured, well, I guess my quality is not up to, <laughs> not up to his standard. I actually took that as a compliment. <laughs> but he's using, so it I, looks like he's using like off the shelf parts. So you could probably <laughs> assemble this, but he's saying, because I did it for you, I'll keep it working for you and make sure. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. is the image pretty, I guess the iPad camera is actually pretty darn good. The, the iPad camera is, is very well, is very good. And I love the little mini uh, teleprompter on the front that your iPad shoots through. So it's like at, at the studios where you're looking at the, at the teleprompter, teleprompter, but right. it's, it's a two way mirror. Right. Yeah. That's quite clever. So, yeah. He yeah. sells that uh, teleprompter uh, individually for 99 bucks. So, well, this is a very interesting idea. The Padcaster, yeah. padcaster.com. The, the Padcaster. Find out more. Watch Dick's uh, professionally produced <laughs> review. Right, but not up to Josh's standards. Apparently not up to his standards <laughs> at his website, gizwiz.com. Biz, G I Z W I Z dot B I Z. While you're there, you might as well take advantage of Dick and play the, <laughs> play the What the Heck is a Contest? Because yes, yes. he's giving away autographed copies of Mad Magazine. All you got to do is identify, <laughs> it's pretty easy, uh, what this uh, gizmo or, or gadget is. Everybody clearly can see it's a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, I don't know what it is. It's a mustache holder. Oh, I know. Oh, it's a, yeah, mustache dryer. That's what it is. <laughs> Designed great. for people with like you with large mustaches. It's a ringer. Perfect. A mustache Perfect. ringer. Yeah. All you <laughs> go to gizwiz.biz. The rules are there. You can find out how you can win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. Don't forget Dick's podcast too, gizwiz.tv, where he and Chad Johnson talk about crazy stuff. I just got him. We should probably. What'd you get? This was $30. Oh, Leo, I just got it yesterday. Wise, I haven't opened the wise mine campaign. yet. campaign. It's awesome. Oh, you you, you hooked your thirty bucks. Mom hooked mine up. It's following me when it hears a sound or sees motion in my studio. It pings me on my phone, oh and I can go gosh. back and I can I can see what the video was. What the thing is? The point is, I can't believe the price. I mean, 30, no, I know. I mean, dollars. Well, well, Chad originally did the first one. It was twenty dollars, right? The one that doesn't move. It's incredible. So this is, uh, yeah, this is. Um, you could see me moving, <laughs> but the pictures. Oh, it's animated. Yeah. You're really not moving. I'm that's not an moving. It's animated. But the picture's pretty good. I mean, that's HD quality. It will pan and move around. To you know, I have to set it up so that it's looking around. You can actually look around. See, do you see that it panned a little bit to yes, to get me yes. in the shot? That's pretty. That's pretty cool stuff. That, now, on your phone, can you pan it? Can you move your phone oh, yeah. and have it? Sure. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. So right now. It's a. It's facing a, a a license. Oh, there we go. So I can I can pan, tilt, and zoom it live. So you can check. Uh, that's you can, that's I can look out the window. I put it near my window. I can see what's going on outside. Look at that. Oh my god. Thirty bucks. Oh, the, the the empty parking space where the Tesla used to be. Yeah. Whoa. Hey. <laughs> well, if if that you know, I can talk too. I could turn on the microphone and go. Hey, get away from my Tesla. Oh, that's a riot! <laughs> can you can you record it with it too, so you would know who took it? You Tesla? can. You can record. It actually has two weeks of wow. free recording time, built in. So for thirty, I don't understand how they can do this for thirty bucks, but <sighs> but they are. They're doing it. Boy, I guess I guess this is where the joke doesn't work. It, volume. They're making they, up in volume. They gotta sell a lot of. Well, them. they're gonna. I bought three of them. I <laughs> sell them for thirty bucks. I'm gonna get one yeah. for uh, everywhere. I know. Someone emailed me and said, you know about this $30 camera? And I emailed back and said, uh, I know about it now, and I just bought one. Yeah, they're and, so cheap. And, and $8 shipping. I'll just with Oh, yeah, you don't forget that. Wise Cam yep. Pan from W-Y-Z-E Cam.com. So that's my yeah. my gizmo. I think it's, it's great. Gizmo Amazing. of the week. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, I'll have more details for you next week when I've played with it a little bit longer, but still. Perfect. Thank you, Dickie D. Okay, buddy. I'll see you next week. Take care. Thanks to Michael Cozio, our musical director. Thank you, Michael, for spinning the discs for us today. And, of course, Kim Schaffer for answering the phones, getting you on the air. I appreciate that, Kim. And most importantly, thanks to you for listening. I really appreciate it. This is a, a fun thing for me to do. To actually make a living doing it? Wow, it's unheard of. I'll be back next time. I hope you will, too. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. 
And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.